Okay, so the next session is about how to manage your CEO. So let me ask you, how many people, hands up, if you're an employee and not the CEO? Excellent. So hopefully, you'll be able to take away some tangible lessons and tips that you can take to rein those crazy people in. Who can empathize with this meme? Hands up. Yeah. Knowing how to handle the prioritization of what to build in your product. When you have so many competing opinions, stakeholders, self-interest, not to mention important people like your CEO or CFO's very strong views, maybe on the type of color of green, for example. So how do you avoid opinion-based product prioritization? Well, this was a, an interest of mine. So a few months ago, I interviewed about 15 to 20 of our top developers. I interviewed Google engineers, Google product managers, directors of growth, and I you know, tried to tease out of them, how did they approach this problem? And you know what struck me was there were two key characteristics. The first is that successful developers rely on data to make a call on what to experiment on first and what to build. And the second really important factor was that they had imbued this culture of data and sharing of information throughout their organization. So to add color and context to this discussion, in a few minutes I'll be inviting on stage both OneTap and 2017 App of the Year winner, Memorize, to share with us their experiences on reining in their crazy CEOs. I know one of them is there laughing. He's not that crazy. So let's get started with, with prioritization. And just a note, the models and suggestions that we make here today are just some of the best practices that you, know, that you can use. So they're not the only ones you can use, but hopefully you'll be able to take away some key nuggets of gold. Right. So just a few seconds ago, many of you had put up your hands to say that prioritization was hard. But it can be made easier with data. Thank you for reconfirming. <laughs> so over the last month, I've worked with the OneTap team to test out a model that Google used internally for deciding how to prioritize what we build. We use this model on Allo, YouTube, Gmail, and we actually have an internal growth team who gets seconded out to our different products. So I harnessed that team, and we worked with OneTap. Now again, this is not the only way to do it. Bear with me. Uh, but if it gives you a different perspective, this is a good thing. Now before I introduce John on stage, let me just give you a brief overview of this Google model. OK, so as you can see, it's pretty simple. It looks pretty simple. It's made up of four components. The North Star metric, user flows, a growth model, and a spreadsheet. Because let's face it, what database model would be complete without a spreadsheet? Now, the model serves to help you uncover opportunities. And more importantly, it serves as a common communication tool for your whole company to talk about growth, products, and prioritization. So to kick off and go deeper on this, the first one I mentioned was the North Star metric. Now, listening to Anthony Ribot's talk about behavioral design, it struck me that we were talking about the same thing, which is it's that key engagement user metric. Now, the way that we define a North Star metric is that it encapsulates everything that you do in your app. And it encapsulates all the value that you're providing to a user. So as an example, uh, if anyone here is staying at Airbnb this week, it would be nights booked. For WhatsApp, it would be messages sent. 
So again, the purpose is to create a shared goal across all of your different divisions in your company, so they're all going for the same goal. The next element is mapping the user flows. Has anyone here mapped their user flows? A few of you. Good. OK, so this might be familiar to you. The way that we approach it is that um, essentially we define user flows as a visual representation of your user journeys throughout your app across acquisition, engagement, conversion, and retention. And that flows from sources of acquisition, critical user journeys. You drill down on some important aspects, perhaps your engagement activities and your retention activities. Now, I can see you taking photos madly. The next bit's going to really mess it up. So <laughs> take your photo now. Once you've mapped this out, and I quite like the color coding. It helps me visualize it better. The next thing you want to do is mess it up with some lines. So you stick in how all of these components relate to one another. The idea being that this will then show you where some of the activities are not supporting the rest of the app and help you identify opportunities to improve. Now, that's all well and good. But I mentioned this was all about data, didn't I? So what we, what's missing here, and which will really rely on you having a very robust analytics system, is to put in the proportion of users who are successfully going from step A to step B, which will then allow you to see where the weak points are in your flow. For example, there might be some uh, issues with return from notifications and some issues with notification permission. You can draw a conclusion there. So this mapping of user flows really helps everyone in your business talk about the product in the same way and understand how their activities impact the overall North Star metric. Once you've worked out where your area for improvement is, I mentioned notifications was something in this example, then the next step is to drill down on what are the key, uh, uh, key levers that will impact that metric. So in the case of notifications, for example, we had average users opted in, we had average number of notifications sent, and for example, the click-through rate of those notifications. This is not rocket science, but just drawing it out helps everyone to be clear on what the potential uh, levers you have are. Now, I mentioned this is need to have a spreadsheet in here somewhere. So once you've mapped out that subsection, transfer it to a spreadsheet, link it all up together, and you can run scenario analysis to compare your different competing ideas to see which one will have the biggest impact on your North Star metric. Now, to tell us more about their experience, because as I said, the North Star metric seems pretty simple, but I think we know there's a lot more complex uh, thinking that goes into it. I'd like to welcome on stage John Butterfield, Head of Growth of OneTap. So one of the things we did when we first started making this product is focusing on analytics. Uh, and we track everything a user does within the app. And this is something that we are really proud of. Um, but we'll see kind of how that un unraveled while working with Tamsin. So the first thing we did, as Tamsin showed you earlier, was we created this user flow, this thing up here. Uh, this is about the 10th iteration of it. The first one had thousands and thousands of different things in it. Uh, and it was just a cluster thing. I won't say the word. And uh, so we dumbed it down to this. And we actually worked with uh, the head of growth at Google on this one as well. And the thing he really gave us as a key takeaway is don't include everything from the app, just the key moments and the key journeys. And the first thing this did for us, actually, was uh, show that we have some problems. And it's at the end that weird mustardy colored bit where it's essentially like an exit point. The user, doesn't the user journey doesn't come all the way back around. So this was the first useful part of, uh, of building, uh, building this model. So the next thing was about the North Star metric. And now this is an interesting one, because for us, it's pretty simple. So our mission as a company, as you can see, is to make being, uh, being self-employed easier than being employed. And uh, so if we want to make this easier, the best thing we can do is uh, quite simple. Uh, there we go. Is collect transactions. The more transactions we collect for a user, the more we can provide value. And it's all about providing that value. So 
transactions per, per user is, an, is a really easy one for us, but then we break it down per product. So with one tap receipts, the obvious thing here is the transaction in that term is a receipt, receipt per user. Uh, now the tricky part here and the thing that really threw us off was what's more important, uh, users adding a lot of receipts or a lot of users just adding a few receipts. Uh, so again, you've got to think about the value and the value is, the, you know, if, if they give us more data, we can then help them with their taxes and do everything uh, for them, essentially. So it is all about receipts per user and the more receipts, the better. So then we put it into our growth model. As you saw, it's like this really long document of all things, uh, every, the whole equation of the growth model. Uh, so I didn't put all that in because uh, it's just too much and it's really boring. Um, but when we first wrote that out, it is about 16 pages of this document and it was just crazy. So again, we took the idea of just dumbing it down and making it something that anybody can understand. Uh, and the headline here was, Receipts added per user, and it's broken down by the MAU, uh, divided by um, the receipt submissions, and then it's the, the receipt submissions, as you can see, are defined by the different entry points and uh, new and returning users. So what was interesting in here, as I said, we're really proud of the analytics and the tracking that we put in within the, within the app. Um, but while we started working on this, we suddenly realized, hang on, we're not tracking this, this, and this, and these are all things that provide value and make it easier for us to, to deliver our North Star metric. So suddenly it made us realize we've got to go back and update our analytics and things like that. Um, and with this growth model, one of the most interesting things it did um, was that it made it easier for us to explain to the CEO, who I won't bash in this session today because he sat right there. Hi, Nick. He's filming as well, actually, which is even worse. Um, so it, it made it so he could see where the, the MAU comes from and then the CFO could see where all the revenue comes from and product, who's also sitting there, could see what, uh, what essentially would work next, to, what levers to pull to get the most amount of uh, value. So then we put it into this calculator, uh, this, this growth model spreadsheet. Uh, this is just the, the first part of it. Uh, but again, you can see here with, if, with the starting values, essentially what happens over 10 days. Uh, and this is just the high level. It goes further into detail as you go into it. But again, that's boring to show here. Nobody really wants to see that. Um, but the best thing is it's, all, it's a predictor. And, this, uh, and in this calculator, uh, this spreadsheet, we actually renamed it the calculator. That's why I keep calling it that. Because to be honest, nobody really cares about spreadsheets, especially myself calculator um, because it helps us predict what we can do. So actually while bringing in the, the equation from the previous one, can I go back, that one? So once we had this equation and we put it into this spreadsheet, uh, we suddenly started questioning where the value was as well. So there was a lot of things we put into the original model uh, that suddenly just made no sense. Um, so we really, it really gave us a good lesson on how, what we should be tracking and why. So it was really useful. All right, and then the next part the, the, is what the model actually gave us. So the first thing is uh, it gave us clarity um, about what it, uh, across all departments about what it is we're doing. So like this, the CEO, Nick, uh, no longer had to like ask about where the malware was coming from and how we could increase it clear as day in this model. Um, and then products didn't have to necessarily ask what are we going to do next, what's priority, it's all based on this. And uh, the CFO knew that by increasing revenue, uh, we increased retention so they could see from the growth model as well, essentially what is happening next. Um, although the, the CFO does, does still sometimes go very Jerry Maguire and show me the money, but that's, uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, and then the resources. The big thing we realized is that because we're a receipt app and we do a lot with finances, uh, we should be putting a lot of priority into accountants, right? Uh, and that's something we've not really done too much of in the past. So it's a huge wake-up call that there's a huge lever there that if we put more effort into that, uh, we could essentially get lots more users a lot easier and help them keep retained. Now, that also helped with hires. Um, so one of the problems you have, uh, that we certainly have, is uh, going trigger happy on Glassdoor and just hiring the wrong people at the wrong time. Um, so this really helps with knowing who you should hire per, per kind of problem you have at the time and what levers you want to pull. So for us, it was partner channels. So that was really good. 
And that's it. That's it. Thank you, Tamsin. Oh, wait on. I think mine's working. Thank you, John. That was fantastic. Um, hopefully that gave you, some, gave you some really good insights into, I guess, one model or one way of working. Oh, thank you. Yes. What was I going to click with? My fingers. Um, one, one way of working to help you prioritize and, and bring the company together. Now, one thing you may have picked up on, apart from the fact that their CEO is in the audience, was that the model really helped them help John to communicate why they were doing certain things with product, marketing, CEO, and all the other teams. So let me ask you a question. How many people in the audience today uh, do prioritization or experimentation by them, just by themselves without working with anyone else? OK, a few people. How many of you? do this in a team, this one team, a lot more, OK. If you're not doing it across your company, you can do better in a very positive way. So to top developers I've spoken to ensure that there's cross-functional representation when they do this kind of prioritization so that everyone's on board and aligned towards that common goal, whether you call it the North Star metric or anything else you like to choose. And culture is critical to this. You need to have an acceptance of risk and return. And to take us through their approach, more on the riskier side, I'd like to invite on stage Christina Nelrusk, Head of Product for Memrise. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so happy to be here. And uh, I know that we are running out of time shortly, and everyone is um, quite excited to get to the longer networking break. Um, I think my talk is going to be brief. I have to apologize. I should be doing this uh, in German, um, working in a language learning app. But uh, English is not my first language, so maybe this is an excuse for this time. Um, Memrise is a favorite language learning app for about uh, 25 million people. Um, it's a very um, vibrant and lifelike way to become confident in using a foreign language um, in any country or um, any situation um, people experience. And we have a record number of over 200 language pairs that uh, people can learn and uh, hopefully eventually speak. Um, and uh, the um, next few minutes, um, I will be sharing some, um, some insights of how we do uh, product prioritization and also manage our CEO. Memrise um, has had a very unique journey so far. Uh, so uh, we've been super lucky with uh, having one of the most creative and experimental um, CEOs out there. Um, it has its upsides, which means that um, it's a great inspiration and it injects a lot of creative uh, thinking and, and experimentalism to the rest of the team. The downside is that it kind of sets a slightly different challenge for, for product people and product team to manage the whole thing and manage all these creative ideas coming out of the brains like that. Um, and um, as an example, um, about two years ago, um, I got a uh, text message from Ed, our CEO, on Sunday morning uh, saying that, um, good morning, Christina. Um, I'm in Scotland. Um, I bought a double-decker bus. Uh, I'm going to find a repairman who is going to fix it, um, a driver um, and the film crew. And uh, the bus is going to tour um, the rest of the Europe, uh, filming videos of native speakers uh, saying phrases and sentences in all these different languages that are spoken in these European countries. Um, so it was quite a unique experience to get a message like that. And uh, what happened was that we, we had to sort of come up ways how to handle these kind of creative ideas and, and very often slightly crazy ideas um, and how to turn them into successful features uh, for our product. So what happened was we um, had to come up uh, with a way how to filter and how to assess and measure such crazy ideas that not just the CEOs, but also everyone in the team can come up with. 
And uh, we kind of felt like spreadsheets and, and different models and uh, frameworks and systems and processes are maybe too harsh for filtering out some genius pieces of, of uh, creative glimpses. And uh, we ended up having and coming up with uh, six criteria for how to filter out uh, useful ideas out of like generic nonsense. Um, and the six uh, criteria um, that we came up with was every single idea has to be iterable, uh, which means that uh, we should start small. Uh, we should uh, uh, take every feature as an MVP um, and then iterate uh, if it is successful. Um, we think that the, the idea has to have an immediate impact. So as soon as we roll out the feature and, and launch it for our users, we do want to see some kind of behavior, behavioral change or, or some change in metrics. Um, it has to have a lasting effect, uh, which means that uh, one-trick ponies do not quite um, uh, work for us. Uh, we do want to build features that uh, have an impact on, on language learners for an extended period of time, not just for the first five minutes or, or the first day. Um, everything has to be measurable, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, it has to have a power of localization, which I think for a language learning app is maybe a unique, but uh, user base um, for almost any app in the, out there is very global, so uh, it's good to benefit from, from making sure that it works in every single language for every culture, for right to left and left to right languages. Uh, and the, finally, uh, obviously, it all has to fit into a coherent product, so even the craziest ideas just have to fit in somewhere and make sense. Um, and we went even deeper. Um, so, in order to keep this kind of um, creative and experimental mindset in the company and then in every single team, uh, we divided our product development um, uh, life cycle into three stages. Uh, the first one being the discovery stage, where uh, we prototype, we sketch, we design, we draw, we use a dust, uh, uh, the idea. Um, we build something that we can sort of get random people from the street to test it out. Um, in the um, Memrise uh, Membus case, uh, the discovery phase included sending the bus to a mini trip to Oxford to film the videos in English first to see whether like, this makes any sense or not uh, before touring the rest of the Europe. Um, and uh, after sort of doing the dry runs and, and testing these ideas out, um, we define it um, in a fairly detailed spec with, uh, with all the functionality um, described, um, everything, all the sketches, all the designs drawn out. Uh, we do involve data team in this um, um, stage of the process quite heavily because they, we have to make sure that we, we build the feature for the right user, for uh, the right use case. We, we track and uh, implement the, uh, the data points in a correct way. So it's uh, super important that, uh, that the, um, the data people are involved in the process. Once everything is ready and set up, um, uh, the development teams take over um, and actually start uh, building the features. Um, because everyone has been um, quite nicely involved in, in the discovery and in the definition phase, uh, it's fairly easy for the developers to understand why we're building things and, and how exactly they need to be built. Um, from the product perspective, um, a super key thing to keep in mind is that even with the most sophisticated systems and, and uh, processes in place, it even happens for the most uh, experienced product managers that you sometimes forget to switch on the feature and the experiment when it uh, goes out uh, so that the users would actually see it, what you've built. Um, and, uh, once everything is nicely set up and, and the new version of the, um, of the app is out, and now it's time to take a photo of this as well, um, uh, it's, the, uh, um, it's the joyful moment of uh, watching how, when and how the results come in. Um, we are organized as well, so it's not like we're all over the place with crazy ideas. We have a standard set of metrics, uh, standard car graphs for every single experiment, A-B test uh, feature that goes out. And, uh, and sort of the day after the release, it's like refreshing this pa page all the time, uh, which is the sort of reasonable and sensible way to, um, to see how the feature and the new idea has performed. Um, in our uh, team's case, uh, it's also the joy and fun of uh, 
seeing the results coming in and, uh, and learning whether we built something super successful that people enjoy or, or whether we need to go back to the whiteboard and, and sort of sketch and start thinking again. So um, I think Eurovision is quite popular in Germany, so it's almost like watching the results and votes coming in and, and then seeing like whether we've won a winning case or losing case. So um, hopefully this has given you a few ideas how to do uh, product prioritization without spreadsheets as well and, and um, also manage the crazy ideas coming from your CEO. Thank you. <laughs>